Pediatric liver transplant can be life-saving in disorders of, of, of the liver uh, in which the liver uh, is injured. There's a number of reasons to require a transplant. So just because you have liver disease doesn't, need you, doesn't mean you need a liver transplant. You know, the main reasons to require a transplant is number one, that the liver is, stops functioning. So liver failure, whether it be acute, which means it occurs quickly, or whether it be chronic, a disease that affects the liver over time and causes it to fail. When the liver stops doing the functions that it needs to do, it's one of the reasons to consider replacing that liver with a new liver. The second reason, a common reason to need a transplantation, is if you have a structural injury to this liver. So instead of the liver being a nice sponge and being very soft and easy inflow of blood, it becomes a rock. It becomes scarred a term called cirrhosis of the liver. Often that's heard with alcohol in pediatrics, that's certainly not the cause, you know, but there are other causes of, of, of fibrosis, progressive injury and fibrosis, scar tissue in the liver that results in that liver being rock hard. Blood flow then diverts around that liver, causing uh, issues related uh, to uh, high pressure, which includes bleeding and, and development of ascites. Um, the third reason that people re can require a liver transplant or children can require a liver transplant uh, would include cancers. And there's a number of cancers that the only way they can be removed from the body is if the liver is removed as a whole. And then it needs to obviously be replaced because people can't live without their liver. Um, the last reason, which is less common, there are certain enzymes that, the liver, that function with the liver that some people are born without and some of those enzymes can result in injury to other organs in the body. The liver that we actually remove is a healthy looking liver, but it is missing something crucial that affects how the body metabolizes certain proteins or lipids or other moieties, or other things that circulate in our body. And in those cases, since we do not have an effective way to replace one cellular function of the liver, we need to replace the liver as a whole. It's a big procedure, it's a big surgery, as, as any surgical procedure um, have risks. The risks are related to the immediate post-operative time or during the OR. It can be vascular complications, it can be biliary complications, it can be infections, and all this can go from mild to moderate to severe to life-threatening uh, complications. There are other complications that are long term and those are related to um, how this new organ do in the body. The patients can have rejections, uh, can have rejection uh, as a part of an autoimmune response um, to the new organ or the patient can have complications related to the treatment or to the, uh, the use of immunosuppression. Then patients that are on lifelong life immunosuppression can have infections or can have other side effects of the immunosuppression that can be related to kidney damage, to the bone marrow damage, lung disease, hypertension, and, and it goes as far as the patients developing cancer, something called post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder or PTLD that is a complication not of the transplant per se, but it's a complication of the medications that we use to prevent rejection. On the other side, we have to know uh, that there are benefits for these patients to get the procedure. Uh, the liver is a vital organ and without liver function we cannot live. Uh, life is, is uh, having no liver function is incompatible with life. A uh, patient can have clotting, fa uh, clotting problems. They can bleed. They can bleed anywhere from outside in the mucous membrane to inside, uh, mainly intracranial bleeds or uh, sometimes pulmonary hemorrhage are big complications. Then um, having and these are complications of the liver disease. Uh, there is also beneficial for pediatric patients to have a liver transplant because without a healthy liver, they cannot grow, they cannot develop, and they cannot do the things that are important for uh, them to have a healthy life. Um, then we need to find a balance when we decide when to transplant somebody. We don't want to do a transplant that is not necessary. People can live for years without li with liver disease uh, and still conserve a moderate amount of liver function, then knowing when is the right time to do the transplant is a key. You don't want to wait until the patients are too sick 
or you don't want to transplant patients that don't need a transplant. Once the medical team uh, makes a decision that a patient may be a candidate for liver transplant, the process of evaluation begins. Um, the candidate's family meets with an entire multidisciplinary team. The multidisciplinary team includes a medical doctor or hepatologist, a pediatric liver transplant surgeon, a nutritionist, a social worker, um, sometimes a psychiatrist for evaluation of mental health, um, a child life team that will show the family around the hospital um, and explain to them what to expect while you're in pediatric intensive care unit or on medical floor and medical unit. Uh, the, this evaluation usually takes a long time, so we do our very best to get the patients here and do everything in one day. They will learn a lot. The medical surgical team will explain to them everything they need to know from A to Z about the process of transplantation, about potential medical and surgical complications. Uh, the social worker will evaluate the, t the family for appropriate emotional support, financial support, um, and social support. There's also a financial coordinator who's involved in the process to help family through some of the financial issues and insurance approvals. There are currently more than 16,000 Americans waiting for liver transplants in this country, and certainly there are more people waiting than there are livers available from donors. A lot goes into decision to list the patient. And once the patient is listed, they get an assigned score. This is a special number that reflects how sick they are, how soon they need this liver transplant to survive. Um, the score is calculated based on recent factors from their laboratory studies. And in children, uh, there's a special score that also accounts for their growth and developmental issues. Once the patients are on the waiting list, they might get a liver the same day they're listed, or they may need to wait for a long time. Once again, uh, the sicker you are, the higher the score is on the waiting list. For children, there's sometimes there's a special status that some critically ill kids with chronic liver disease meet as well if their medical care requires an immediate liver transplantation. However, we can never predict how long you have to wait. Uh, once a patient is listed, uh, the transplant team also makes a decision whether or not the patient may be a candidate for living donation. And if they are, the family is referred to a separate team, a living donor team. The donor liver it can come from cadaver or from the living person. Living donor procedure, we use a piece of liver, typically from an adult. In a cadaver, um, we could use whole liver graft from a cadaver, or also we can use a piece of liver from a cadaver. Using piece of liver from cadaver liver, we call it split uh, liver trans split graft. We call it split graft or um, reduced size graft. The split graft refers to a procedure um, that we separate, we split the liver into two pieces and use one small portion for a child and then rest for the adult, rest for an adult. Uh, reduced size liver transplant refers to um, reducing the size of the liver but don't use the other half. Depends on the size of the donor, these options to put the entire liver in or to reduce it or split it, we have to be very flexible adjusting the size of the recipient. With use of all those options, whole liver graft, split graft, and reduced size graft, we have been able to transplant children very quickly. The mortality while waiting is almost close to zero um, in pediatric liver transplant program. And a child has been typically transplanted within three months from the listing. And because of the small size of a child or a baby who undergo liver transplantation, pediatric liver transplantation is a technically demanding operation that has to be done well-experienced expert team. The possible risk includes a surgical complication such as a thrombosis of the artery, 
um, thrombosis of the portal vein, meaning the blood clot formation in the portal vein or artery, or also leakage um, of the bile duct connection or the stenosis, uh, narrowing of the bile duct connection or clotting of the bile duct connection. All these connections has a higher risk of either clotting or narrowing because the size is small. But with well-experienced pediatric transplant surgeon and team, those complication rates are not necessarily high. In my experience, the earliest patients that we transplanted successfully were done in the 80s. So some of these folks who were transplanted as infants are now young to middle-aged adults with families of their own. The outcomes of liver transplantation depend on several factors. First, the condition for which the transplant is being performed. Biliary atresia, the most common, is a good disease to treat with liver transplantation because it doesn't return in the native liver. That is, in some disorders that are seen, for example, in adults, if a virus caused the liver disease, it may return after transplant. So most children who receive a liver transplant are dependent on the success of the liver transplant only. And here's where biliary atresia is a favorable condition because it doesn't return. However, once a liver transplant is performed, the patient becomes entirely dependent on anti-rejection medications to adjust the immune system for the long term. That means that disturbances in the balance between the immune system and the foreign liver may result in rejection. This is most common at the beginning, but may occur at any point over the years and requires the patient to take the anti-rejection medicine very carefully and every time at the right dose. The long-term aftercare is the most important component in terms of the relationship between the patient, the parents, and the medical team providing that care. The care of a liver transplant patient begins with the liver transplant, it doesn't end with the transplant. The issues in the post-op period uh, include management of the disease that brought you into transplantation, management uh, of the immunosuppression, the drugs used to prevent you from attacking the liver, which to you is a foreign a foreign body. A, you know, it's no different than a splinter would be, where it's normal for your body to try to remove a splinter, it's not okay for it to try to get rid of a liver that's seen as foreign. Luckily, over time, the liver becomes accepted by the body. When the liver is transplanted in a person, it comes with some of the white cells, some of the, the immune system from the donor, and it integrates into the recipient, and they become a type of chimera, or they become a combination of themselves and the liver, and they stop attacking the liver. Um, in the fresh post-op period, which is, which is a co-managed period between our surgical services, between our medical support services and our ICU team, as well as our social worker, nutritionists, infectious disease specialists. It's a period in which we have to recover from a major operation. It's a period where we have to adjust medications to permit the liver to find a home. And it's a period where we have to prevent complications like the infections that can occur related to an operation in a sick patient on drugs that lower the immune system. That said, the usual stay in an intensive care unit ranges up to about three days. And uh, when a patient uh, comes in electively from home for a liver transplant, that patient may be in the ICU as little as a day or two, will be in a hospital five to seven days, you know, usually seven days, maybe seven to ten days, I'll correct that, seven to ten days. You know, a more complicated patient who was very ill going into transplant, who literally had his life saved at the last minute, that patient will be in a hospital usually for a couple of weeks, if not up to a month. Um, the, you know, the perioperative care is complex. When done well, you know, surprisingly, patients do extremely well. Um, the care then continues in the outpatient setting and for the rest of the patient's life. We make a tremendous effort here 
to carefully transition our children as they grow up away from the children's doctors to the adult doctors, but without losing the tender loving care and the attention to the whole patient that is nurtured throughout childhood. This is a difficult time for every uh, transplant team. And because our adult and pediatric teams work closely together, we're able to do this exceptionally well.